Good evening, Mexico. Good morning in Cambodia. On behalf of La Buena Impresión, the APSAR Authority for the Protection of Sites and Management of Angkor Region, the National Authority of Pradia, the NET of University of the Royal University of Cambodia, the National Institute of Anthropology and History, and the PVVA Foundation, we welcome to the first Congress of Colloquium of Archaeology and Anthropology, Mexico, Cambodia. Second journey, I'm Bertrand Levoix, Associate Professor of the University of Monterrey. This second conference is going to be given in Spanish and we offer you translation in the languages English and Khmer. To choose the language of your choice, please click the button of the language of your choice. This button has the shape of a globe. Choose the language and to cancel the original voice, click on the option silence original audio. We ask the panelists to close their microphones. There is a button for questions and answers. The chat is available for everyone so that you can pose your questions and make comments. Everything is going to be recorded by this team and questions will be managed. For this second conference, we are glad to welcome Dr. Nelly Robles. She is director of the Archaeological Zone of Montelban and of the National Council of Archaeology. She is director of the excavations at the archaeological site of Atzompa in the state of Oaxaca and is member of ICOMOS Mexico. The conference is being and becoming an archaeologist in Oaxaca, Mexico. I am very glad to share with you a short CV of Dr. Nelly Robles. Originally from Oaxaca, she is full-time archaeologist at, at the INA Oaxaca Center. She holds a master her degree in restoration of pre-Hispanic architecture and a doctoral degree in anthropology from the University of Georgia, USA. Dr. Robles is recognized for her leadership in the field of archaeological resource management in Mexico. She is author and editor of books on the topics of Oaxaca archaeology, conservation of cultural heritage, and history of archaeology. She has been director of important archaeological and conservation projects in Oaxaca, such as the Mitla Project, the Monte Alban Management Plant, the Monte Alban Restoration Project, and other archaeological zones after. At present, she is director of the project of buildings damaged by the 1999 earthquake in Monte Alban at Sompa, supported by the World Monuments Fund. She has been awarded with different prizes. She, the Manuel Toussaint Award from MINA for the best research, restoration, conservation, and dissemination of all architectural heritage in the Mitla project. The INA Francisco de la Maza Award for the best work in conservation as a restoration of architectural heritage in Monte Alban. The George the Award for Excellence in Cultural Resource Management of the George Wright Society in 2017 and by the Society for American Archaeology in 2011. As Fulbright Scholar, she pursued her graduate studies in the United States and was a visiting researcher at Harvard University in 2013 and 14. In 2020, she was awarded with the Federico Escocia Award given by the Mexican ICOMOS for her outstanding professional performance in conservation and heritage management. Welcome, Dr. Nelly Robles. Good evening to all of you. Good morning here. Good evening here in Oaxaca. We have some changes of schedule, schedule a little complicated, but with the will of all of us, we are going to take this extraordinary event ahead, this event prepared by our friend Fernando Aceves from La Buena Impresión, and also by the National Institute of Anthropology and History, which is the institution for which I work. 
I am looking looking at some known faces of friends that have been seen here and there in international encounters. Welcome to all of you. I am glad to greet you tonight. And I would like to start speaking about the importance that an approach between Mesoamerican sites and the area of Angkor has, all of Cambodia, that is an extraordinarily rich country in terms of archaeology, but also in aspects like techniques of conservation. And why not to say in the last years, they have reached worldwide fame regarding the outline schemes for preservation of the site very accurate and the site of Angkor in recent years has been a site that everyone looks at because its management proposal has been very interesting and especially has been thought by different brains from all over the world without demeriting the performance of local archaeologists. But I think it is an example of all that has been the international cooperation and is a good example of a practice that can be shown to the world. This about how an archaeological site must be managed, which is really, in it's in fact a general proposal of the management of one of the large sites in Mexico that I've been lucky to be able to manage in the past years. I was director of the Monte Alban site and I was in charge of making its first management proposal. After 1997 and we ended until 2012 and over this large period we could make a number of innovations on the site, making it a, an important site for investigation. And we transformed it into a World Heritage Site, which complies with all the international standards for preservation of the sites all over the world. It's been a good experience. And that's why the title of my presentation is being and becoming an archaeologist in Oaxaca. And this is very interesting because one thing is what we think when we want to be an archaeologist. And another one is the, what we face when we are an archaeologist. As in my case, it was the management of one of the large si sites as this. I have had a very good experiences and I have made a summary here for you that I will be very glad to share. First of all, we are locating in the Mexican geography, we are located in Oaxaca in the south of Mexico. We are close to two mountain areas. We are located on the central valley of Oaxaca, which is the center of our entity. And Monte Alban is characterized to be a site in the upper part of a hill. And this is very important to explain the topographical formation of this site. And this especially obeys to the search by the Mesoamerican peoples in their world view of the rocky massives where their large settlements were located every time that mountains are sacred spaces where the gods inhabit, where the deities of the cosmogony of the Mesoamerican people reside. And in this sense, Monte Alban, since its inception, was planned to be a sacred city. That would be the great capital of the Zapotec culture. 
that we have in the valleys of Oaxaca. The sites around Monte Alban, which are a kind, a sort of satellite quarters, are located on the tops of the hills, resembling the importance of Monte Alban in the different stages. This way, we begin with the concept of holy or sacred city. And Monte Alban was founded 500 years before our era. This way, we can start establishing some of the comparisons between the large sites. And we can see that Monte Alban is one of the most ancient cities that we have in pre-Hispanic Mexico, older than Teotihuacan and older than Tenochtitlan, of course. And it's these sands, this is one of the lo most long lasting cities. Its foundation began in the 500 before Christ and it was abandoned until 850 of our era. Along these centuries, a large project was completed, a project, architectural and religious project that gave life to one of the most important cities of Mesoamerica. In this sense, these are general views of the main square of Montelvan that allows us to appreciate the architecture of this site developed overall around squares. The main square of Monte Alban is very famous and its image has been seen all over the world because it is an icon. It is unique in its style. It comprises 60 hectares and the main square Let's think a little bit that it was that it was pressed by hand. Men work to level the ground, to level the, the top of this hill. And in this case, they evidently needed a large workforce, a great population working in the construction of their city. Once they achieved to have a flat land on the top of the hill. They began the construction since the first time in the 500 before Christ. The monumental constructions began in that year. And these constructions give Montelban the monumental character of a world heritage site. Therefore, in Montelban, we will find a series of pyramidal basements or basements, which are temples that served for ceremonies dedicated to the gods and goddesses to give sense to the agricultural calendar that ruled the life of Montelvan and also to consolidate the great power that Montelvan gathered since the first times being a state that little by little conquered different communities in its surroundings and reaching until the boundaries of the state of Oaxaca, a very large region that they dominated from this center of the cult, Zapoteca culture. This is one of the reasons why it was inscribed on the World Heritage List in December of 1987. This is one of the first archaeological sites. And after this, our task has been to work for this site from the point of view of continuing the archaeological research and also to take all the measures of prevention to avoid unnecessary damages, to prevent risks in some of the sites that are very important and also to have a management plan that is suitable for this large site. Some of the views of the landscape and of Montelvan can give us an idea of the great development of this culture. The architecture and urbanism were always respectful with the landscapes. 
and these spaces were always dedicated to the most important feature that was their religion. And probably a hundred of gods and goddesses were venerated along the ritual calendar of 13 months and 20 days. We also have something that is very important for Montelban, that is the funerary architecture. That is to say, there was a large investment of time and a great effort to build the funerary chambers or tombs where the remains of the dead were deposited. Evidently of the upper classes, belonging to Montelban, the most important people, the highest classes had the right to be buried or deposited in their tombs, deeply ornamented on the upper part of the hill, but below the roof of their own houses. This is a Mesoamerican practice that is very common. The duality life and death is going to be developed along all the history of Montelban. That is to say that for the dead, it was very important to rest below their house and this way share the life cycle again. In this sense, this is a great lesson to understand the cycle of life and death among the Zapotecos. Some of the motifs of the paintings in Montelban are allusive to the resting of the people buried there and the ceremonies organized around the death with characters coming from different places, rulers attending the funeral that could last long. Once the remains were deposited inside the tomb, the tomb was tombed with a rock and it was not open until another deceased from the same family had to be buried there. This is how we can understand that continuity was very important in terms of power. And the rulers that could be buried in those chambers were chosen among that relationship of power. We were lucky to continue with a very important research task begun in the 1930s by Dr. Alfonso Caso, a very famous Mexican archaeologist in fact, the first academic archaeologists of Mexico and who chose the site of Montelvan to undertake one of the long lasting projects of the country. In Montelvan, he began his research in the year 30. And it was in 1960 when they stopped the first part of those works and then and when the archaeological museum was opened so it called the attention of all the archaeologists and Dr. Caso by that time had a very important role in the in the cultural politics of the country and that investigation was a little relocated but this work was complemented inside the National Museum of Anthropology, which today is one of the best, if not the best, museum of the country. And it is one of the great places that we have to visit when we come to Mexico. In this sense, Caso's works not only attended Montelban, but also the other sites in the Valley of Oaxaca, Yagul, Viteco, Tainzú, Mitla, of course. And for some other sites, the north of the valley that were in which they 
discovered remains in the High Mixteca. Caso discovered another culture, the Mixteca culture, and placed it on the cultural map of Mexico. And that's why Mixtecos and Zapotecos are very thankful with Dr. Caso because thanks to him, these cultures were known because before uh, only Aztecs and Mayas were mentioned and very few mentions of other cultures were made. But Dr. Caso was very skilled and he could place and give a place to these cultures of Mexico. And this way today, speaking of Montelban is speaking of one of the most important cultures of the country. The first archaeological seasons were characterized by some events that also for tissues led to a series of discoveries that placed Montelban and Oaxaca in the field of the large findings of world archaeology, such as the case of the discovery of the tomb seven of Montelban occurred in 1931, that is to say at the beginning of Dr. Caso's research in which he found in this funerary site, a series of objects, precious objects that were part of these funerary spaces. And it was a great luck to have found these sanctuaries were human remains were deposited in a series of jewels and a large quantity of very valuable objects of gold, silver, shale, obsidian, turquoise, and at least 16 different kinds of materials and more than 800 objects founders such as that were part of this opening of what was a Zapotec tomb. And in later times, a mystic group came to this place and deposited those objects. This discovery placed Montelban in the list of the large discoveries in the world. Montelban was one of the main characters of the international series in the United States, especially in Chicago where all the finding was taken there in a very interesting trip that was recently studied. And that gave a very visible fame to Montelban. But the research of Montelban didn't stop there. By 1970, the arrival of American archeology span to the cultural area of Oaxaca was very important because with it, new theoretical paradigms came and in a certain way were useful to complement what has had already been done in excavation of the central area of Montelban. And then these groups of young archeologists with environmental ideas were devoted to make tours around the main square and they discovered very large complexes of human remains and the result of their research is this map that embraces over 2000 hectares in one of the sites that is obviously the largest in the Valley of Oaxaca. It was since the beginning capital of the place. And after research of Richard Blanton and other colleagues, the shape of the city was defined. It has been very interesting to understand Montelban from an urbanistic perspective in which we can establish that there was a central part, but in the surroundings were located other settlements that were also placed on the top of the hills and that complemented the city in a later stage.
Montelban then began, since the pre-classical 500 years before Christ to be developed on the main square and little by little expanded to other territories and grew as a city until reaching to be this complex city that we can see today. In the case of the central part of Montelban that can easily be seen on this white spot, we can see some of the complexities involving the management of this large city. The aerial picture that we can see is clearly defining the central square, but all the surroundings, as we can see, are in process, is in process of construction. Being Montelban so close to the city of Oaxaca is receiving large pressure, an urban pressure, and it's becoming an urban invasion to the site. And this condition is obviously worrying. And this has been one of the main axes of the management plan of Montelban. Today, we have established a permanent program of attention to the polygon of Montelban to prevent losing archaeological data. as far as possible and to prevent invasion of dwelling into the site and also to establish agreements with the communities around the Montelban to try to control this urban process. As I was saying, Montelban was inscribed in the World Heritage List of UNESCO in 1987. And after establishing the management plan, the World Heritage Emblem is going to be a main feature in the life of the site. This is an emblem that following the rules of UNESCO was taken by the work team and became the emblem of Montelban and the emblem of all the different programs and projects undertaken on the site. Remaining constantly its condition as a World Heritage Site. In this same sense, there are infantile programs that take the program, the UNESCO program of heritage in junk hands. And in Oaxaca, we have worked on this project with children in school age during their vacations. They are invited to be guardians for one or 10 or 15 days and to be with the archeologists and understand the complexity of having a site such as this. I was mentioning that the official protection area was defined in 1993. And Montelban stopped being just that spot of the main square and it became a large area which is the one that is making us speak with colleagues in different sites in the world in order to establish some joint programs. I'm not going to torture you more with schemes, but just to have an idea of how we are organized in the management of Montelban, here is a chart. We all work for the National Institute of Anthropology and History and we depend on the INA Center Oaxaca and the archeological area of Montelban is a direction and from there stem five or five work areas which are pillars of the working axis 
in order to organize and have an adequate management of the city. This outline was very useful and allowed us to establish contact with other sites in the world of the same category of archaeological site to compare actions. Research and conservation are some of the most important axes of the management plan. Obviously, the colleagues that are present tonight listening to us, the colleagues from Angkor, know perfectly that more than half of the time in these large sites are devoted to make conservation. In this sense, it is one of the large surprises that we find when wanting to be an archaeologist in Mexico because research is almost a privilege for which we have few time and few resources, but it's done. But the main task is really the conservation, which is the one that allows us to have a balance on the site. Not only the architectural details of the buildings and the elements that degrade the sites, but also the ecologic balance of the sites. This has taken us a long work with biologists because we are also trying to involve the natural areas preservation and we try to re-encounter the balance of the pre-Hispanic city, the balance that the city had during its life in order to give Monte Alban a more integral character for visitors. We are not exempt of risks and an important part of the management plan is risk preparedness. The attention in Monte Alban is focused on two main events. The first one, the earthquakes, we are on a highly seismic zone, and we are on a region where five tectonic plates converge. And at the time of moving one, all the others start moving. And this is a risk for this site. The risk of a plate starting to move and it multiplies the movement until causing some disasters like the disaster faced by the last earthquake. That were in fact series of, of earthquakes. There were more than 200 and they caused serious damages to vernacular architecture in Oaxaca and also damaged the pre-Hispanic architecture of Montelban. This is the last large project of attention for damage by earthquakes. We also had assisted the earthquakes of 1999 that destroyed some buildings. And in this sense, documentation is important to mention because we have been facing a crusade to adequately document the sites and to have answers when we have problems of telluric movements like those that we have faced recently. The other large risk in Montelban are fires, forest fires that occur each drought during the months of November until April, which are seasons with few rains. And at this time, the hill is very dry and with each unwilling fire, or a lightning, fire can be caused and with a little wind, the fire can reach the archeological site. So we have a strategy for fire management, along with other institutions like the Conagua and Conafor. And we constantly train the personnel to learn how to work in team to fight fires. In this sense, both earthquakes and fires have been 
important in archaeology. We have understood that seasons in pre-Hispanic times were a factor that people faced and they were aware of earthquakes and part of the iconography of Montalban refers to earthquakes by obvious reasons. And making archaeological research, we have found that in many cases, buildings have been repaired several times. And this trying to alleviate the effects of the earthquakes that were also very often. As we never have enough staff, we include social service and volunteers in Montelvan. We have been lucky because many students have come to Montelvan to continue with their studies and to help the archaeological site. And they also receive from archaeologists formation and training. And in this way, each student that comes closer to Montelvan is completing a tour around the site in such a way that the student that spent a six month period of social service with us at the end is completely aware that being an archeologist in Oaxaca or in any other Mesoamerican site implies more than just making archeological research. And this is very important, especially with all of us who are involved in World Heritage Sites. We need to give answers to all the circumstances that daily arise in these incredible sites. I will mention some of the most important aspects why Montelban was so important besides being one of the first planned cities in America. Montelban was very important because since its first epoch, it developed an ideographic structure, a communication system that really stands out because of its antiquity. We see 500, before, 500 years before Christ here, a series of messages of power were transmitted, everything related to power and religion. This stele that we can see here in this gallery are stele, carved stele called dancers, popularly called dancers, because in the first times when Dr. Caso discovered them, workers thought they were dancers who were dancing because they seem to have a certain movement and they could identify in them some movements resembling dance. In fact, they are not dancers. Some are captive warriors who were sacrificed in the fight for power. The J building that, con that is a later building this is from the Epoch II of Montelvan. It's very characteristic because it is a unique building on the main square. It's style, it's architectural style, and its layout is very interesting because this is not a pyramidal base basement, uh, but it is a building with a capricious shape like a point of arrow. This is a building carrying a double message. Its walls are formed by large stones carved in which concur messages can be read. Each stone contains the message of the conquer of a town near or far from Montelvan, which was subdued and forced to pay tribute. 
the state was the form of government of Montalban, and this evidently had institutions, an army, and the tax system, and in this sense, this J building is very important because this was the first building that clearly showed the work of the state, showing in a certain way all the con conquests made by Montelban over all the territory of Oaxaca. Those tunnels that we can see in the building are a series of tunnels, tunnels along the building dedicated to astronomic view. It, this was a building dedicated to astronomy and in that way, this is unique in Oaxaca. And this is unique in Mesoamerica. Although there are other astronomic observatories in Mesoamerica, but not a building devoted ex exclusively to this. Later examples of writing in Montelban were given towards 650 and 800 years before Christ, after Christ. And these are very complex structures like the one on the center, the one to the left is an early figure and the one in the center is the latest. That, as you can see, is very complex and it depicts conquests. There is a character sitting on a throne and in a certain way is being presented with all the magnificent details around him. And these are monuments in which some stories were told, official story, stories of the Zapotec state, and that fortunately for us were made in stone. So these are remains forever. We have counted around 400 carved monuments that we are gathering from everywhere because each time an epoch ended in Montelban, all the monuments, even these carved stele were discharged and were sent to the landfills of the region. So it is very complicated to find them. We have good examples of the first manifestations in this place in the L building, which is the dancer's building. These are the characters that I was telling you that were sacrificed warriors. They were mutilated and were carved there as a clear message for all the people that have access to the main square. All of them could see those messages of power carved on stone. This is why one of the large projects that in recent years we have been working on, this being worked with the World Monuments Fund was the rescue of the carved stones, the process of recovery that I was telling you have been dispersed along the main square and other buildings detached from their original places or loose around. And we created a laboratory of loose stones where we are gathering all these pieces in a closed space and we are documenting them. And as you can see the last picture in the upper part, these were some of these pieces were found abandoned, semi buried, and little by little we have been developing a, like an ant work, extracting each one of those pieces to move them to their new area that was built with international funds. And we opened a, an entire laboratory with 3D scanners. And we are now copying every piece, making three-dimensional models. 
trying to offer the best possible documentation of this history of writing developed in Montalban, which is a very important aspect. Likewise, our laboratories in Montalban are obviously devoted to the management of ceramics, of the different types of objects look, find, found in the different stages, the funerary urns that are very famous in Montelban. These are worked here. All the process of classification, cleansing and restoration is developed here if necessary. And also bioarchaeological research in Montelban has been in vogue in recent times because the Oaxaca Ina Center established a laboratory of osteology in a in an adequate place and Montelban obviously with the so large amount of tombs found around 250 that have been explored. Unfortunately, many of them have been looted, but all the materials these tombs can offer us are gave very valuable materials that now are being investigated. From the teeth and bones, we are extracting materials, the stable isotopes, DNA and other for different studies. And that way we can see that the population of Montelban is ready for those studies. This part of research that takes us a long time is permeated by all the social activity in the surroundings. And this way we face very complex situations in terms of land tenure, the land uses, and the quantity of social actors or stakeholders that are using spaces around Montelban or in Montelban. And we share with them the concern of the safeguarding of the site, although sometimes we have neighbors who not necessarily are convinced of this and they try to make diggings and they try to build houses and therefore there is an archaeological rescue project in which we try to involve them to show them the dangers faced by the site. In this sense, we have received many help of the communities. We have 12 communities, very large communities around, and we are speaking of more than 100,000 people living around. And instead of looking at them as a menace, like we are trying to see them as allies to rescue the remains. And these images show us the quality of some of the findings that have been discovered along with the neighbors. Sometimes they are very rich and emblematic tombs, like a wolf tomb. Sometimes they are large, so large findings and other times they are small. So we must have criteria to manage each of them. San Pedro Ixtlahuaca is one of the communities, the most traditional communities around Montelban. And there some stella were found as well as some tombs that were very interesting because they were from the epoch two, which depicted those scenes of sculptures inside the night. And the population took active part on this. And at the end, what was very interesting was that the finding was a medular part of their community museum. These are part of the works with the communities. And we built a sense of identity and of belonging and rooting with common places through archaeology. Research for education is present at Montelban. Each year, we receive a large number of visitors, many of them students from schools, and we support them in their education, not only in terms of archaeology, but also environmental. We have a permanent reforestation project for 
the areas affected by fires and it is carried out each year with the neighborhoods. And I'm going to show you at some part the first quarter that was investigated archaeologically in 2007. This is a lesser important place than Monte Alban, but this research was made with modern techniques of archaeology and restoration that have given us a result, the encounter with a wonderful site that is at Zompa, in which today we are working in. There, the Zapotecos, late Zapotecos of the year 500 after Christ until the time of abandonment, were characters that really enjoyed landscapes. In Atzompa, in contrast with Montelvan, all the buildings allow looking at the landscape, and this makes of Atzompa a really spiritual site. Atzompa has given us very important discoveries. For example, this funerary building, where in contrast with Montelvan, we found overlaying of tombs that constitute one of the most important findings of our project. We found these funerary urns in the tomb 242. The archaeologists are a little square in this way because we named the findings with numbers, but these characters fortunately had their names written on the wrist. So the great character is the Lord Eight Tremble, who ruled at Sompa in ar around 600 years after Christ. And his companion is a female urn, which is Lady Water, who has drops of water all over her body, but she doesn't have a calendar associate. So we can deduce that she was just a companion for the main Lord Eight Tremble. And this way continues the life of Montelban between management, restoration, attention to communities, and so on. So each year we organize different academical events to celebrate the inscription in the World Heritage List. Each year in December 10 and 11, Montelban celebrates this inscription as World Heritage, and we reflect with the personnel and the communities and the academicists on how, as a way of reinitiating the cycle each year and to carry out the project of Montelvan to a good end. And I think that with this, I finished the exposition about Montelvan. But I didn't want to stop telling you something. And this is why we are so interested in sharing our archaeology and findings with our colleagues from Cambodia. This is because we share the World Heritage appointments, and this is because both Angkor and Montelvan have had a large history, a history in which we have faced destruction, a history in which we almost have everything to do and therefore we face similar problems. I've been in Angkor only once and that was enough to know that we need to stretch bonds to support each other in this complex problems of conservation and research of our sites. I wrote an article about safeguarding in Angkor when I came back from my work there, safeguarding of Angkor through international cooperation, because as I was saying at the beginning, this is really an example of international cooperation, how the world joined hands to save Angkor and it was achieved in a brilliant way. In this sense, Angkor and Montelvan, 
as you can share this idea are a possible relationship and a very desirable relationship. Thank you very much for your attention and good night. This for your brilliant presentation. We are going to open an, a space for questions and comments. And we are going to ask Master Fernando Aceves to make a short intervention. Sure, I am very glad that Dr. Nelly Robles accepted to take part in this Colloquium of Archaeology and Restoration. Although archaeologists have worked in an uninterested way with the aim of creating bonds. And with our basic question for youths from Mexico and Cambodia, Cambodia what motivated you when you were young to dedicate your life to this profession? I also want to thank the Minister of Culture, Punta Cona, the National Authority, and to the Rector, Kim Supadi, of the Royal University of Fine Arts to Diego Prieto, who was with us. And I also thank this team that has been supporting us. And especially Chao Sun Keria, who has helped us a lot. Dr. Hampu, director of the National Authority of Sara, and all the team that supported us in this. We expect that this can lead to agreements and projects between both countries. Thank you very much. And this is all I have to say. Thank you very much, Fernando. I can't see questions from the panelists, but I will ask what motivated you to study archaeology, Dr. Nelly Robles? Why archaeology and not other career? When did you decide to study archaeology? I had the chance to grow in the middle of the Oaxaca country. My parents, as teachers, always moved along the field and they went from one school to another in Oaxaca. And in that time, there were few teachers and a lot of necessity of teachers. So each year we had the chance to go to one place and then to another in different towns with different cultures in Oaxaca. Only as a data in Oaxaca, 16 indigenous languages are still spoken. So it's a, an incredible cultural diversity. And every time we were in a new place, people came with us and they showed us archeological objects that were like their little treasures in the town. Look at this figurine. They came from here and from there. And here we have them. Let's see if the professor wants to do something with them. So after that, I understood that for us, the Oaxaca people, we had the privilege of living with archaeology in our backyards. So it was like very natural to choose archaeology because I grew up with that constant exposure to archaeology. Later, I tried to study some other things, studying medicine for some years, but I was always certain that I missed the field and the sun. And this way, the influence of the large teachers like Dr. Romano, who tried to convince me that these were, this was my field with sun and ground than being in a specialized laboratory, but it was very easy to decide. Thank you for your answer. And there is a question on the side from Gustavo Gomez. He's asking what caused the fall of Monte Albán as a society? That's a question that archaeologists constantly ask. We are convinced today that it was not an event, but it was a series of events or circumstances with multiple factors 
where different roles were played, whether changes, the reduction of the capacity of production, production of food, and also to get tribute to pay to the city. And this obviously broke any control system on one side, but on the other, we still have very clearly that the distribution of the quarters around Monte Alban means that the city grew towards these points, but also the central part reduced its power. And this way, the genealogy schemes were a little heavy and started to control other spaces around the main square. Therefore, the city couldn't grow anymore because there was lack of workers. There was much tribute to be paid. And the importance of other enclaves as at Zompa and Jojocotlan weighed on the decisions of Montelban, so it began to fail by its own internal contradictions. Another issue was the life on the hill, which was obviously very full of symbolism, but is very complex. How to preserve a city 500 meters over the valley of Oaxaca where the fertile lands were found. So the decision was gradually to go down to other sectors in lower lands near the milpas and near to the food production and little by little, the city lost. Thank you for your punctual response. I have another question about your vocation. How much would you have been attracted to other archeological projects outside Mexico? We see that there are archeologists that are attracted by projects in Asia and South America and in other parts. This is probably the easiest question. I would love to have a project in Angkor, but it's very important. This question is important because until very recent years, Mexican archeology, span that is to say the Mexican archeology span schools produced archeologists specialized in Mesoamerican studies to work in Mexico and to work inside the National Institute of Anthropology and History. Until recent times, other projects have been incorporated to these research campaigns in large archeological areas all over the world. But the truth is that studying archeology span in Mexico is somehow to be born with this seal as property of Mexican state, and we need to develop our career inside the country. Obviously, there is nothing hindering us to go out and make archaeology abroad. Archaeologists travel a lot. But if along my exposition, did you notice that being archaeologist in Mexico is, I would say, 30% is to make archaeological research and the rest is to comply with a life commitment that is the preservation of the site, the conservation of the archaeological heritage. And in my case, I have been very lucky because the INA itself specialized me in preservation of archaeological heritage. Then I went to the United States where I studied anthropology so I could see the connection between the past and the present. The real reason of preserving archaeology is found in the present. We make, we make archaeology, or at least in my project, we make archaeology and conservation, but we make it to explain to the people about their past and how can they help to preserve it. And this that is easy to say, in fact, takes a life commitment. 
And also the dissemination works are very important and that is a close part of the archeologist's core to investigate, analyze and share the knowledge and also to, dis to disseminate the works. And then the relationship with the community is very important. Yes, with the communities, which are very much around Montelban and beyond the sites, with all the communities of Oaxaca, but especially with the school groups, that is very important for us. We constantly seek to give talks and workshops and putting in place school programs to leave these concerning kids so that they get concerned on the preservation of archaeological heritage, but to get from them the recognition to our work and to show the junks in the career that archaeology is always a good option. Which advice would you give to youths in terms of studies considering COVID and the lack of economic resources? We really like that kids learn and joining, that they like archeology span and that they enjoy making a finding. That is very important, not only to dig mechanically, but that they can understand that Behind each small and large finding, there is a story to be told, a story that is about to be discovered. So as far as they don't lose the capacity of astonishment by an archaeological finding, that is how we motivate them to enter into the field of archaeology. And we have been successful because many youths have decided to inscribe in the National School of Archaeology and they have come back with us to work in Montelban. Are there many archaeologists that have gone to study to Mexico City and then have come back to Oaxaca to work? And if they speak some of the languages, how do you, how do you see that in Oaxaca? Before, we didn't have many indigenous archaeologists. Most of them were people from the city. And they were like me, lucky people that could study this. But the truth is that nowadays there are many archaeologists who come from indigenous populations and speak indigenous languages. and who leave their reality as inhabitants of in ancestral communities. And they are true jewels for us because they can explain and understand some things that we couldn't. For example, we had some students from the East of Tehuantepec who shared with us many considerations around the old. And that is something beyond archeology. span And they said that sometimes it's important to rescue the sites, but sometimes not because they are old and we need to leave them die. So they are sometimes reasoning based on a philosophy that we don't have share or in my case I didn't have it but some archaeologists who are integrating to the field of archaeology have that that experience and give us those lessons and they shock us with those reasonings and they obviously are right or for example in at Sompa we have found a series of offerings of broken pieces like dishes and other objects. And these offerings are extraordinary. And in the mythological work, we recover those remains and try to restore them. And suddenly we found some large pots 
beautiful at some pots and some artisans came with us and looked at them and they had seen the findings in the site and they say, but why did you restore them? The Zapotecs wanted them to leave them broken because they were about to leave their sites. So those reasonings are truly valuable in the world of archaeology and they make us reason in a different way and they make us understand that there are elements of value in each of the findings that we make that are not necessarily made for science. And these are cultural values that we cannot understand, or for, unfortunately. But that has allowed us communication with colleagues who have just entered the world of archaeology and have enriched us very much this field. Thank you very much for your response. Fernando, we are about to close. Fernando, can you give us some words? Hay una pregunta en inglés. ¿Podría decirnos algo más acerca de las inscripciones? Y si estas están relacionadas. Can you, could you say something more about the inscriptions and whether these are related to the existing 16 indigenous languages you mentioned being still present in Oaxaca Valley? We know that, that the linguistic root of all the languages in Oaxaca is the Otomangue mother tongue, and from there, from this stem, all the languages spoken in Oaxaca. We don't know in which time in Montelban began to be spoken the Zapoteco language, but we know that the ideographic expressions depicted in the stele. have a shared meaning and they had collective values. This probably until the last epoch when there was a convention to write the calendar and they had defined all the days and all the months in the calendar. There began to be a more articulated communication, obviously the Zapoteco that had its roots there, but we really don't know exactly, or at least I'm not a linguist, but I can't say in which time Zapoteco started to be spoken, but I can say that the legacy is so deep that it would be strange to know that at least around the classic by the 200 or 300 of, of our era, the Zapotec language was spoken in Oaxaca. from the Embassy of Mexico in Thailand, concurring with Cambodia, we greet and congratulate the inauguration of this colloquium. Congratulations to the organizers and thank you to the panelists. Thank you to Cynthia, the ambassador. Also, Adriana Lopez Ridao congratulates Nelly Robles. Thank you also to Fernando for the initiative. And we are going to close the second journey of the Colloquium of Archaeology and Restoration in Cambodia. Some final words before leaving. This is a very nice experience to be on a site generating such a particular ambience, and especially Monte Alban has a space that is another dimension. The fact of working in a place like that, where each second is irrepetible in eternal spaces, this is the same environment as Angkor. So this strategy being implemented is very interesting. Working with youth is great. 
youths are finally the ones who will preserve the environment. We live in a time in which the construction is unstoppable, given the demographic explosion, the tourism and everything. And the only thing we have is to raise awareness through art, through education. And I think that is, this is joined. This way we arrived to Cambodia. And we realized that there was no to printing press in the entire country when Mexico has this large tradition of engraving. And it was welcome. Thanks to the enthusiasm of the Rogel University of Fine Arts. In that time, the rector was Wang Tumat and Suchenda, who opened the doors to us. And we are still welcome there. And they are here. Kim Sutin is here, the rector of the Royal University of Fine Arts. So I only have to say that if this colloquium was possible, it's because there was something in the air and we could conjugate it thanks to Chao Sun Keria and all the effort of Mexico and Cambodia. And I look forward, this continues. We have many similarities and extraordinary past times of rupture that were very difficult and great cultural losses in both countries. And this has marked us forever. We expect that more Mexicans and Cambodians have the pleasure of meeting each other. Thank you very much.